All right, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and tonight is the night you have all been waiting for. I have two very experienced debaters with me tonight. I've got Tom Jump and Dr. Kent Hoven here with me to debate the important topic, is there reasonable evidence for evolution? Between both of these uh, seasoned debaters, Kent and Tom Jump, I believe we are looking at something close to about 600 debates uh, these gentlemen have participated in. And therefore, I am sure this is going to be a debate to remember. Gentlemen, let's uh, let's kind of break the ice, get to know each other a little bit before we start this much anticipated battle. Uh, Tom, it's been a little while since you have been here. I think the last time you were here was maybe six to eight months ago, uh, debating Bill Morgan, which was a ton of fun. So how you been, what's going on a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your channel. Uh, I'm doing good. I recently cured my major depression. Um, so I'm feeling significantly better, very melancholy all the time now. It's a very interesting feeling. Uh, I run a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash T jump where I crush creationism and god debates all the time very fun occasional flat earther those are fun um i sell bathtubs i have i have a engraved bathtub from standing from truth he, he's got one of mine in his in his in his uh abode it's, it's great he, he's got the gold laden one it's perfect um i've debated kent three or four times we've known each other for quite a while now i i do this full time it's my job please give me money um thank you uh, i'm starting an atheist church working on trying to Create a church that actually helps people. Our goal is to decrease the cost of living for as many people as much as possible, as opposed to what most churches do. And by doing this, we're going to get an apartment building. And since it's tax free, we will offer rent at a lower price and hopefully replace the very corrupt businesses of America, which take money from poor people for no reason with good companies that actually help people. That is the goal of the atheist church. So I will leave it there. Well, I appreciate that introduction there, uh, T-Jump. How about that? <laughs> One of these days, I'll, I'll say that word right. So I appreciate it. And yeah, that bathtub you sent me, it's it's doing fantastic. So I appreciate that introduction. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Dino in the house. How you been, brother? What's going on? A little bit about yourself. And how's everything at Dell? Well, my name's Kent Hoven. I love the Lord. Been a Christian 53 years and want to get everybody else converted into his family. Uh, God's been very good. Some of God's kids drive me crazy, but God is good. And we're building a creation ministry in, in Lenox, Alabama, Dinosaur Adventure Land. We get visitors from all over the world. It's all free. Come on down. We have a science center, 12,000 square feet of cool science experiments you can do. We have 20 cabins. People stay for free. And after a couple of days, we give them a hammer, put them to work. The whole place has been built that way. It's been amazing. Uh, we have 140 acres and 16 lakes for fishing. And we love it here out in Lenox, Alabama, population 35. Well, come on down and see our place. And I do a YouTube channel, uh, Kent Hovind Official, and on Dinosaur Adventure Land, run about on a bunch of other platforms too. I believe the Bible is true and evolution is stupid and dangerous. All right, I appreciate that introduction, uh, Dr. Hoven. Again, gentlemen, thank you so much for giving us your time for this heroic debate. So I'm gonna go over the format real quick for the audience sake. We are going to be having a formal uh, professional debate tonight. We're gonna be starting with uh, 10 minute opening statements and then a six minute uh, uninterrupted rebuttal. Uh, then we're gonna have uh, roughly a 30 minute open discussion where Kent and Tom Jump are discussing uh, the topic focusing on one topic at a time and keeping it as equally timed as possible. Then we are going to have five minutes closing statements. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We're gonna have an audience Q and A. So please make sure you are tagging me at Standing for Truth with your questions and that way I won't miss them. Okay, that being said, let's get right into the fun. Uh, T-Jump, we're gonna hand it over to you, uh, my good man for your 10 minute opening statement. Awesome. So uh, to get started, we're asking, is evolution a good scientific hypothesis? And to know that, we need to know what is a good high scientific hypothesis is. Uh, and in science, what the goal of science is to provide a method to differentiate imagination from reality. We, When we see something, it may just be a figment of our imagination, or it may be something that's actually there. Or when we come up with any idea, like a god or whatever, it may be it really exists, or maybe it's a figment of our imagination. We need some way to differentiate between the two. And the way science does this is novel, testable predictions. That means predicting the future, stuff we don't know yet. And if there's a theory that can predict the future, that 
about things we don't know. That's a very good reason to believe that, that theory is correct. And the other ones that can't are probably just imaginary. Evolution has been able to do this better than pretty much everything else combined. Um, no other theories have ever been able to successfully do this, especially not uh, religious theories. So evolution is significantly better than all of the others. For example, the, one of the best examples of evolution is endogenous retroviruses. Endogenous retroviruses are viruses that inject themselves into the placental uh, or early reproductive cells and inject DNA that will then be passed on to all of the offspring that are had by whatever this organism is. And we can find patterns in all of the different species. There are tens and tens of thousands of these, and we can find that they're in the exact same location in multiple species. So if you have a three billion long base pair of DNA, and in that three billion long base pair, there is a segment of 50 or so that is in the exact same position across species. Uh, the only ways this could happen would be one random chance. So if the retrovirus decided to inject itself at the exact same point in all the different species randomly, or uh, they come from a common ancestor where it, the retrovirus injected itself into the common ancestor. And then as it reproduced and evolved into different species, the pattern in the DNA was copied as all DNA is, and it shared the same position in all these different species. Now, if it was just random chance, the probability of a retrovirus injecting itself into the exact same position um, in multiple species, all in different reproductive organs, is ridiculously low. It's it's crazy. It's it's significantly more than a tornado building an airplane. It's a tornado building a multiverse. It's it's, it's not going to happen. So the more plausible explanation here is that um, evolution actually took place, and a retrovirus injected the placenta of a early organism, and that early organism um, continued to reproduce and evolve, evolve into multiple different species, and each of those species share the retrovirus. Now, it gets more complicated than this because there's a lot more than one retrovirus. There are tens of thousands of these, and so the probabilities um, explode exponentially. So this is not plausible to have happened by chance. And if a designer did it, the designer is a moron because many of these retroviruses have no or a degrading function to them. So if you deliberately put him in all these species, he's an idiot. Uh, so that, that theory is a bad explanation. More importantly, this was predicted by evolution. We expected to see these in evolution. We would not expect these to see to see these in the design hypothesis. Therefore, the design hypothesis does not make this prediction. Evolution does make this prediction. Then it's only one of many. Uh, others would be biogeography, predicted by evolution correctly. Sig many, many. This is just a class of thousands of predictions that have been found. Uh, fossil distribution, Tiktaalik being a great one. They predicted to find a transitional fossil between uh, water species and land species in a specific location uh, within a one kilometer range. And they found it exactly in that specific location in that specific uh, geographical uh, whatever strata, which is a fantastic prediction made by evolution. Again, there's been zero predictions that I know of ever made by creation at all. So it, it's kind of winning by a significant margin here. Uh, direct observation, we can directly observe both micro and macro evolution in lab. Um, so we can we can literally see it. That's a, that's a pretty big thing that was predicted by evolution and rejected by every other hypothesis, specifically creationism. And so the fact that we've literally seen it has kind of debunked the creationism hypothesis completely. Uh, not, not a good start for creationism. Uh, autonomy, we can see homologous structures in different creatures. That was also predicted by evolution, which was confirmed with the microbiological data on DNA. So all of these are testable predictions that have been confirmed by evolution. Uh, evolution happens on both large and small scales that we can directly observe. And there's many different embryological and anatomical different lines of evidence that we can look at the different growth trees of the embryology and compare them between species to see the similarities of how they evolved. Um, the evidence is quite numerous. So... I would conclude that yes, evolution is a very good scientific hypothesis that makes tons of novel testable predictions that have been confirmed and observed in a lab and in the environment, and no such testable predictions have been made for any other hypotheses, and so evolution wins. I'll conclude there. All right, I appreciate that opening statement there. T-Jump uh, with a few minutes to spare. And as always, we can toss that into either the discussion or the audience Q&A. So what we're going to do now is hand it over to Kent. 
Kent, you have your 10-minute opening statement. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, <clears throat> excuse me just a moment here. Uh, let me get up to where I wanted to. Okay. Uh, I would have to agree with uh, Tom on at least one thing. Science is things we can observe, study, test, demonstrate, et cetera. Uh, that comes from the Latin word seer, which means to know. What do we know? We know cows produce cows. We do not know cows came from an amoeba over millions of years, which is what he believes. We know dogs produce dogs. That's science. What he just shared with us is a religion a hypothesis that maybe if we give it millions of years, it would change to something else. No farmer in the history of the world has ever seen any plant or animal produce anything that anybody would consider a different kind. Now, the definition of species, we went over that several debates here on this program. Nobody's ever got a firm definition of species either, but I don't know what exactly a kind is. The Bible says they can bring forth after their kind. So I think most four-year-olds would tell you. But from all we observe with science is cows produce cows. No exceptions. Some people try to limit the definition of science to the natural world. The operation of the world may be understood by scientific discoveries. We understand how gravity works, you know, how the speed that things fall, etc. We understand air pressure, and we understand a lot about the operation of the world. However, the origin of the world may not be understood by scientific discoveries. What we see is gravity working. Where do, who made gravity? We can't tell that, okay? We don't know where it came from. We don't even know what it is. To call it an attraction of masses is one thing, but that does, you know, give me a jar of gravity and paint it red. What on earth is that stuff anyway? So I think we, we know the operation of the world, but that would not answer the origin. We know the operation of ERVs, as he mentioned. We don't know the origin of ERVs or the origin of life or the origin of matter or the origin of time or space. Those things are outside the realm of science. But Tom wants to include his religion of evolution, believing it all just happened by chance with no designer. He wants to include that in the category of science. I'm sorry. Science is what we know. We do not know that dogs came from an amoeba. We know dogs produce dogs. That's been observed plenty of times. You can even take a creature with a very short generation time, like an amoeba. I think they grow up, get married, have kids in, you know, 20, 30 minutes. It's not, maybe not amoeba, but some, they, they uh, divide in half. But there's those that do by uh, conjugal uh, uh, re replication, they have very short generation time. And we, we, so we, in one human lifetime, you can see thousands or hundreds of thousands of generations, and we never see a bacteria produce a non-bacteria, a virus produce a non-virus. We just don't see that. It's not science. And the purpose of this debate tonight is for him to present evidence that science, that evolution is a reasonable scientific theory. I would love to see that. The operation of a computer can be understood by science. We know how it operates. We don't understand the origin of the computer that may not be understood without appealing to a designer. No computer in the world ever made itself. None. No wristwatch ever made itself. No ink pen ever made itself. We understand the operation. We don't know the origin. You don't know the origin of life. You don't know the origin of the earth. You don't know the origin of species. Darwin's book never did talk about the origin of species in his book, The Origin of Species. Uh, religion is a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. That's what Tom has. He has a religion, but he will never admit that, I promise you. He thinks it's part of science. The creationist worldview says God created everything about 6,000 years ago. That's what, that's what we believe. We're not asking that to be taught in the school system, though, so the burden of proof is not on us. They believe 18 or 20 or 16 or 17.22, whatever it is, number, billion years ago, the, Earth, the whole universe came into existence from a dot of nothing exploding or dot of near nothing. That is not only not science, that is stupid. The whole Big Bang Theory is the dumbest idea in the history of humanity. I'm amazed that a grown man would believe such a thing. Then they believe the Earth cooled down 4.6 billion years ago, or 4.54, I guess they're down to now, and developed a hard, rocky crust and rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. That's all part of the evolution theory. It is nonsense. It is not science. The Bible says in six days, God made the heaven and the Earth and everything in them. Well, based on that, I can make some predictions, scientific predictions. I predict the universe will show evidence of intelligent design. I think we see it everywhere. This ink pen shows evidence of design for a purpose. It can't make itself. Every cell in your body, Tom, is more complex than the space shuttle, and you got 100 trillion cells, each one with 100 trillion atoms. It's designed. Get over it. 
Just common sense would tell you that. I predict there will be thousands of symbiotic relationships in nature where the plants breathe in the CO2 and give off oxygen. The animals breathe in the oxygen and give off CO2. They reciprocate the gases. That's a cool symbiotic relationship. If you wish to believe that happened by chance, you're welcome. I believe it was designed, and I think it was designed very well. You have all the systems in your body, that symbiotic relationship, your digestive system, your muscular system, your skeletal system, your nervous system, all that working in symbiosis with each other, I think is pretty cool. All the animals seem to have that evidence of design. I predict there will be limits to the variations that things can produce. Certainly dogs can produce different kinds of dogs. Chihuahuas, Great Danes, you know, Dobermans, no question. There are now 339 recognized breeds of dogs by the American Kennel Association. I would say they probably had a common ancestor called a dog. But you guys want to take this evidence of variation within the dog kind and imagine SpongeBob style that it goes forever clear back to an amoeba. Your family trees do show, uh, let's see, the family trees do show an amoeba turning into everything. That's not science. Based on the prediction that God made the world, there are some scientific predictions. I predict there's going to be a purpose to life because somebody designed it for a reason. I predict there will be non-material things in this world, not just material matter, things like love, justice, mercy, innate knowledge of right and wrong, conscience, absolute truth. Where do those things come from? Where does love come from in an evolutionary materialistic world? If, we're, if, if you're nothing but animated meat, pure matter, well then, how do you get these imaginary things? And if your brain is nothing but chemicals that got together by chance, how could you trust your own thinking? How can you trust your thoughts and your reasoning process? And how, do, how on earth do you tell right from wrong if evolution is true? I predict there'll be a way to find the will of the creator, like maybe messengers speaking for him, or maybe even a book telling us how he created it and why. To me, it's common sense. If somebody designed this world, he would tell us what he wants. He owns it, and he makes the rules. And if your city passes a law that says the speed limit's 40, and they're going to give you a ticket for breaking that, well, then it's up to the city to pass a, to publish, publish the law and to post it, put up a sign, speed limit 40. And if somebody knocks it down, they preserve it. They put up another one right away. I think if God's going to be the judge one day, it's his responsibility to publish what is his law, what's he want, and to po post it and to preserve it. I think I'm holding a copy of it right here. I think I know God told us pretty clearly what he wants, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore, God himself came down, became a man, and said, I'll do it for you. Now, if you'll accept my payment, my death on the cross, I'll forgive you. And I did that 53 years ago. I gave my heart to the Lord. He's now my Savior. I'm going to heaven, not at all, because I'm good. I'm forgiven. I predict there'll be a life after this life where we face the Creator and give an accounting. I predict, Tom, you're gonna, your knee's going to bow before that Creator one day. You can be proud and haughty and cocky now, but we'll see how it, how it holds up for you on Judgment Day. Now, if I'm wrong, I haven't lost a thing, Pascal's wager. If, if, if you're wrong, you've lost it all. So I predict the, there will be an order to this world. Everywhere we look, through the microscope or the telescope, we see incredible order. Not chaos coming from a Big Bang explosion. We see the galaxies moving around, the dancing around of the stars and the planets in perfect orbits around the Earth. The Earth at just the right distance in the Goldilocks zone, spinning at just the right speed, just the right amount of gravity. <clears throat> what if we were on a heavier planet? Too much gravity, we couldn't even stand up. Everything is designed. I don't know how you guys can't see it other than what the Bible says, 2 Peter, willingly, willingly ignorant. You mentioned ERVs. I've got quite a bit of stuff prepared on that. We'll bring it up more if you'd like. Long regarded as junk DNA or genomic uh, dark matter, endogenous retroviruses, ERV, have turned out to represent important components of the antiviral immune response. These remnants of once infectious retroviruses not only regulate cellular immune activity, they may even directly target invading viral pathogens. So if the ERVs are in the same position on all the genes, that could very well be an intelligent design. I think you'll find a whole lot of cars for many years had the engines in the front. Yeah, that's a good design. And they had round wheels. Uh, that's a good design, better than the square ones. So I think you're taking the, the things that we see that, wow, look at this similarities and saying, well, the chances are a billion to one or quadrillion to one that it happened by chance. Not if there's a designer. I predict if we go to the Ford Motor Company and look at the pickup trucks they're building, you'll find all the engines in the front. That's a good design. That's all. So you're, you're completely, you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing and completely misinterpreting what it means. 
ERVs are evidence of design. They're part of the development before the embryo is even implanted uh, in, the, in the uterus. <clears throat> in this jam, we summarize mechanisms by which retroviral fossils protect us from viral infections. One focus will be on recent advances in the role of ERVs as regulators of antiviral gene expression. Scientists 30 seconds. identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses. They have a beneficial function in the body's immune defense against common bacterial and patho viral pathogens. You can read all about it. You guys are so desperate for any evidence for your theory. You're now jumping on ERVs. You gave up on the rest of them, homology and uh, gill slits and all that stuff. Bring those up. I'd love to talk about that. Anyway, I think there's no evidence for evolution. It's the dumbest idea in the world. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dino, for your opening statement. I appreciate the opening statements from the both of you. Uh, great chat already. We are close to 300 people and I see questions flying in. So I appreciate it. As always, we're going to have a solid audience Q&A. Just make sure you're tagging me again at Standing for Truth. Okay. So we are now in the rebuttal portion of the debate. We're going to hand it back to Tom Jump. Uh, Tom, you have six minutes on the clock. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Sure. So, science, so Kent said science can't know things. I don't think Kent knows what knowledge is. Knowledge is a justified true belief. So if you can have a belief that evolution happened, and you have a justification, which is the evidence evolution happened in the novel testable predictions, which have been confirmed the tens of thousands of them, that is a justified true belief. That's, that's, that's knowledge. So yes, we can have knowledge that uh, dogs came from amoebas because we have a justification, which is all the evidence. We have a belief and the belief is true. That's that's what knowledge is. So yes, we do have knowledge. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Kent has some different definition of knowledge than all of the philosophy textbooks. Um, he said the origin of space, time, and matter. That's uh, the Big Bang. We, we we can know that. That also makes novel testable predictions, which have been confirmed through the Large Hadron Collider, through the LIGO experiment, to observations in the cosmic microwave background. Yeah, those are all predicted by science and, and not religion. So science has all the evidence to explain those things. It's only reasonable to believe the thing that has the evidence. And it's unreasonable to believe the thing that doesn't have evidence and is just making stuff up. So yes, that, that one, we can know that one too. Um, he said religion is a hypothesis of the causes, nature, and origin of the universe. That's not the definition I'm aware of. That's that's cosmology. I, I don't know what he's talking about here. Religion, religion as defined by the dictionary, is a belief in worship of a supernatural controlling power, especially a personal god or gods. I don't I, I must have missed this part in the evolution. I don't I don't see any supernatural, no controlling power, no god or gods. I don't I just I, I have missed it. I don't see this. I don't I don't see it. I, I want to make an atheist church. I want to make an atheist religion. I, I plan to do this. Evolution isn't one though. I don't I don't get it. I, don't, I think maybe there's some different special creationist dictionary I must I must gotta buy from some some place to find out all these new words that Kent is teaching me. Um next Big Bang is the dumbest idea. Well, I mean, that's 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 interesting. I don't know. I don't think it really compares to a talking snake, a talking donkey, and a god who sent bears to maul forty children for making fun of a bald guy. I don't know. That, that seems a little a little more a little more ridiculous. But that's maybe that's just my opinion. I don't know. Maybe who knows? Ken's predictions are quite interesting because they're not really predictions. He said that uh, there's no evidence. There's no there's evidence of design, but he didn't present any evidence of design. He presented an argument from ignorance. He can't understand how complex things form. Therefore, complexity equals design. That's called an argument from ignorance fallacy. That's literally the opposite of evidence. That's a fallacious argument. He said he predicts symbiotic relationships. Well, Kent, that's not a prediction if you literally see it. To predict it, you have to not know something, and then you have to make a prediction, and then you have to see the thing. If you already see the thing, and then you just say, I predict I see that thing, that's called a post hoc not a prediction, a post-diction. So that's not a, not a prediction. You're just explaining things we already see. Anybody can do that. It's called post-diction. That's why it's not actually evidence. That's why it's not, doesn't support your position. Um, he said there's limits to variation. That's great. That That's good. What are these limits? Which, which part of the DNA thing can't be changed? Because as far as I know, every part of the three billion long base pair can be changed just fine. And it happens all the time. It doesn't seem like there's any limits to mutation here. Like I, I don't, I'm missing the limits here. Which which parts of the DNA can't be changed? Um, he said that there are non-material things. That would be great. Like evidence of non-material things, phenomenal evidence. Uh, I don't see any. Purpose of life? Do you have any evidence? Can we, can we give any novel predictions of the purpose of life? No. Consciousness? Yes, that exists. It's material. It's the consensus in neurology, psychology, cognitive science. 
philosophy of mind, all physical. So not non-physical. Love, all evolution. All evolution explains love. Absolute truth, that just means sentences correspond to reality. There's no non-physical thing in absolute truth. It just means A equals A. Does that describe reality? Yes. Okay. We have absolute truth. No non-physical things required. Innate knowledge, like the cuckoo bird has innate knowledge that it doesn't like eggs. And so when it, when it hatches, it immediately pushes out all the eggs. That's from biology. because biology gives your brain certain tendencies of things it likes and doesn't like. Uh, no non-physical things required there. Uh, how do you trust your reasoning process? Well, because our reasoning process is a product of reality. So our reasoning process can't do things that aren't in reality. So like I can't imagine a round square. I can't believe I exist and be wrong. So there are things, if since our brains and reasoning process is a product of reality, it can't do things that don't correspond to reality uh, completely. They can't do logical contradictions. You can't imagine a round square. So we can trust our reasoning process because there are many facets of our reasoning process that can't be wrong. Uh, God's morality. Well, that's funny because God drowned millions of babies in the global flood. And again, I, I love 2 Kings 2.24, favorite quote. Um, some kids made fun of a bald guy and God sent two bears to go maul the 40 kids. Perfect morality. Love it. Just the greatest model of morality ever I've heard in my entire life. Uh, he's, he predicted that there's life after this life. Again, fantastic prediction. I would love it. Do we have any evidence of this? No. So, I mean, it's just, you got to you know, confirm. You know, the prediction has to be confirmed to be evidence. You can't just make a prediction. Like, I can predict I'm going to win the lottery in a million years, but until it happens, it's not actually evidence. You got you gotta to you gotta confirm the prediction. That would be, that would be a good one. He, he mentioned Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager does not work because even if there is no God, just nature, there could still be an afterlife. And in the afterlife, the laws of physics determine that the only people who get the reward are the atheists, the rational ones who don't believe nonsense. Therefore, all of the religious people who do believe in a God will go to the hell and all of the atheist, rational people will go to the heaven. Therefore, the probabilities for Pascal wager are exactly the same, whether your belief is for a God or for no God. Um, so those Pascal's wager doesn't actually indicate anything that doesn't support anything. Uh, for ERVs, he mentioned ERVs. For ERVs to be evidence of design, it needs to be a prediction. You need to predict it before we know about it which you didn't do evolution did that you didn't you didn't do that you just you just looked at it and then said oh here looks here's some information we're going to post talk explain that information which is a post diction so it's not evidence of creationism you're just making stuff up to explain the data and fit it into your hypothesis which literally anyone can do any hypothesis can do this science has known this for a million years it's called post hoc rationalization um which is why it's not evidence anybody can just make up how how their explanation explains the data why is the world round? Because a magic leprechaun made it round. Like, okay, is that evidence? No, but can you post hoc explain it? Sure, anybody can do that. So that's not evidence. So um, nothing can present it with evidence. You just post hoc rationalization and evolution crushes that in every conceivable way. I will conclude there. Okay, Tom, thank you for that rebuttal. That was about uh, six and a half minutes. So to be fair, we will give uh, Kent equal time. Uh, Kent, whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. You have roughly six and a half minutes. All right. I don't know if anybody else feels like Tom's talking 10 times too fast to understand a single word he's saying. Anybody else feel that way? Uh, I got a couple words out of that. Uh, Tom, this debate tonight is supposed to be, where's the evidence for evolution? I still like to see you offer that. What is it? Just simple, we're not here to attack the Bible and some bald guy, you know, saying he wants the lions to attack, bears to attack the kids. That's got nothing to do with it. Where's the evidence for evolution? Your religion is on trial tonight. You believe these charts like this, that an amoeba, a, a protozoa, or a single cell creature turned to a human. This is the textbook example of what they're teaching, that a single cell creature became everything. Here on this chart, they've got the humans, the bears, the elephants, the dinosaurs, the grass, the tomatoes. Everything came from a single cell creature. This is what is being taught. This is my objection. This isn't science. This is a bunch of lines on paper connecting very different creatures. They have a shark and an octopus and a squid and a snail all and grass and roses and flowers and wheat and everything going back to a common ancestor. My question would be simple. Tom, do you believe these charts represent reality and science? Is this something we can know? Nobody's ever seen a shark produce a non-shark baby. Never have seen that. If you wish to believe they came from an amoeba, congratulations, you can believe whatever you want. But that's not science. Science is what we can observe and study and test. Show me which animal or plant you think has produced offspring that are different than its kind that would lead to the conclusion that everything has a common ancestor. 
they draw these lines on paper, the phylogenetic tree, and say, look at this, animals, fungi, plants, all have a common ancestor. That is religious belief. Nobody's ever seen a cow produce a non-cow or a dog produce a non-dog. It's not observable science. We can see a variety of bats. I think there are now 1,100 varieties of bats that have been classified. We can see a varieties of elephants, four different, two, two appear to be extinct, but the African, the Asian, the mammoth, the, the mastodon, they might have had a common ancestor. But everything inside this circle they drew with all the lines is religion. Nobody's ever seen an elephant produce a non-elephant, but they got the elephant connected back to, wow, the dolphin. Do you, Tom, do you believe an elephant and a mosquito have a common ancestor? I'll answer for you. Yes, you do. And where is the evidence for that? That's not science. They say all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor, which was a primitive unicellular organism. My objection is, this is what the kids are taught every day, and this is a religious belief. You have successfully invaded the school system and forced your religion down the throats of every kid who has to go, and all everybody else has got to pay for this to be taught. You guys who believe that all life forms, including the ele elephant and mosquito, had a primitive unicellular organism as common ancestor. This is what you believe. This is what you teach. This is your privilege. But it's not science. The debate tonight is where is the scientific evidence for evolution? What is it a reasonable theory? You can draw lines and say the mammals, which include the humans and the birds have a common ancestor. And they do draw these lines all over the place. Heath biology textbook sitting right there. And the crocodiles also. Oh, wow, we have a, came from a common ancestor. This is religious belief. My point is it's not science. All these charts you guys make claiming common ancestor, wow, they've all got common ERVs. So we don't observe the animal producing anything other than its kind. Bobcats produce bobcats, birds produce birds, but they got birds and turtles going back to a common ancestor. Do you believe birds and turtles are related to a common ancestor? I would agree that probably a variety of birds are related to a common ancestor called a bird, but that's as far as it goes. My whole point is evolution is a religious belief. The evidence indicates fossil evidence. Stop. stop. No fossil is going to count as evidence for evolution. When you find a fossil in the dirt, all you could prove is it died. Here's a fossilized clam. I could not prove this had any children at all. I certainly could not prove it had children that lived, and neither could you. And nobody in the world could prove it had children that lived that were different. All we see today is clams produce baby clams. That's all anybody's seen. So if you wish to believe and imagine SpongeBob style something else, go ahead. But stop calling it science. It's, I think it's nonsense. I think it's stupid. I think it's criminal to call that science and teach it to kids. They draw the lines on paper and say, look at this. Everything's connected. Oh, there we got the dolphin going and the whale or the elephant. Wow, look at that. The manatee and the elephant and the dolphin have a common ancestor. That's not science. It's a bunch of lines on paper, and the kids are taught this stuff. So the Bible says clearly they're going to bring forth after their kind. That's all we've ever observed. I've chosen to believe that. I can't prove that, but I know this. You won't find a farmer in the world that'll tell you that mosquitoes ever produced a non-mosquito on their property or the cows produced a non-cow. We just had a lamb, had a, a sheep, had a baby a couple of days ago. Had a, it turned out to be a sheep. Whoa, who'd have thunk it? Our, our mule had a baby, turned our, our donkey, turned out to be a baby donkey. That's, our chickens have babies all the time. They always, always are chickens. My point is, it's the burden of proof is on you to prove, to offer evidence for why on earth you would think a family tree like this uh, is, is science. We don't observe it. We don't attest it. I tell you what, test it. Put an amoeba in the laboratory. Get as many as you want, billions of them and try to make them produce a non-amoeba. Where is the evidence of an amoeba ever producing a non-amoeba? I would like to see that. Over to you, Tom. Okay, perfect timing. Uh, Ken, I appreciate that. Let me shut the timer off. And gentlemen, that concludes 
the opening statements and the rebuttals. Great debate so far. Uh, lots of great points to discuss here in the dialogue portion of the debate. Let's discuss one topic at a time as we do our best to remain on topic. Is, oh, just a second, a little bit of an echo. Okay, we're good now. Uh, topic being, is there reasonable evidence for evolution okay let's jump right into it uh dr dino just ended with his rebuttal so tom let's allow you to start with the uh, first point or, or first question go ahead gentlemen. sure sure so uh kent said that i've never seen a non-cow come from a cow now i've never seen a non-kent come from a kent like his son specifically but i can still show that his son is his son because i can look for patterns in the dna so even though i've never seen i was i didn't see eric being born i didn't see Kent impregnate his wife. I, I have no idea these things happen. I've never directly observed them, but I can still prove his son is related to him by looking at patterns in his DNA because there are specific mutations that only exist in Kent's DNA, and we can find those patterns in his offspring because the way offspring are formed is by the mutation of those cells reproducing and creating the same patterns in his offspring as in him. Now, luckily, the same process has happened throughout all life, and so we can see the same mutation patterns in different species and know they're related in the exact same way we can know Kent has a son. Even though we've never seen a non-Kent come from a Kent, we can still conclude that they're related because of evidence, novel, testable predictions. It's the, the ERVs, the mutations in the DNA. So those things are the evidence, Kent. I don't need to directly see a non-cow come from a cow. I just need to look at its DNA. Just like if I want to know if Eric is your son, I just I don't need to see a a, a non Kent come from a Kent. I just need to see his DNA. Okay, let's hand it over to Kent. Uh, equal time. Go ahead. Okay, Tom. Are there any limits to how far this DNA can change? Is a, a man producing a boy child that grows up to be a man? Is that evidence that an amoeba can turn to a whale? Is are we? I think all we've ever seen is humans produce humans and whales produce whales. You wish to believe because we see changes in the DNA and the son is not exactly like the father. Sure, all the cows are not exactly like the mother, but they're still cows. All the birds are not exactly like the mother, but they're still birds. You are imagining and muddying the water here to make it where people say, oh, wow, maybe that's true. We, we Sure, humans produce humans. Some have red hair, some have white hair, blonde hair, some have brown hair, some have black hair. They're still human. Where is the evidence of anything beyond what any, I mean, a man producing a boy that turns up to be a man is not a change that's going to support your theory. So where's the evidence that is my son? Do you think the difference is between me and my son and then his son? And if I get a grandson or great grandson out of them, do you think there'll ever be a time when they're non-human? Yes. You think there will be? Yes. Is that a scientifically observable or is that just a belief system you have? The evidence for that is scientifically observable. Yes. Explain what you mean. What evidence? What evidence would make, make a make? Let's just take a simpler organism like an amoeba. Is an because they've got a short generation time. What evidence would you have that an amoeba will ever eventually produce a non amoeba? Do it in the lab. Where's the evidence? Well, so I can answer that the same way. What evidence do we have that a non Kent or that a Kent will produce a non Kent? Well, we we look at the offspring of. Kent and see, oh, look, there's a difference. In the D there's a difference in the pattern in the DNA. It's a non-Kent was produced by a Kent. So there's not an exact copy. Like you haven't produced Kent's DNA exactly 100%. There are differences. So a non-Kent can come from a Kent, even though I haven't observed this directly because I can see differences in the DNA. So if I want to conclude that one species will produce a different species, I would say, well, if this was the case, we could look back at different species and we'd see that there are the same patterns in this species and in this species DNA that make them related, just like that we can determine that a non-Kent, Eric, is related to Kent because it has similar patterns in the DNA. So if we see the same patterns in DNA change across species in the same way as they do between father and son, then we can determine, hey, this they share a common ancestor, just like your children share a common ancestor. The DNA patterns work the same in both. Tom, you are muddying the water by saying a parent produces a kid. Let's say an adult human produces a miniature human. True. That's still a human. And yep. that's sure there's changes. He's different than me, and I would, I'm different than my dad and my granddad. But there are they, by deliberately trying, man has produced a whole variety of dogs. They select for the smallest one until they get the useless ones like the pug and the chihuahua, okay? They're still dog, barely, okay? 
Is there Clearly. any chance? Is there any chance all this selective breeding? Okay, they've gotten dogs now as small as a toy chihuahua. Is there any possibility in a billion years they will ever get a dog as small as a flea? Uh, sure, it's possible. Or are there limits to the dog size? Uh, yes, like it couldn't be smaller than an atom, obviously, because they're made of atoms, so there's definitely a, a size limit. Okay. If there's a size limit, we've now got the Great Dane, which is a pretty big dog. Do you think they'll ever crossbreed dogs and get a dog as big as an elephant? There are animals as big as an elephant, you know, like an elephant. <laughs> yes, there are animals as big as an elephant, like an elephant. Yes, I agree. Oh, can, they get, yes. can, they get a dog, can they get a dog as big as an elephant through selective breeding? Probably yes. You think so? Okay. Yes. This is imagination. All experiments and observation says, hey, there's a limit. You might get a big dog, but not, the more, the further you get away from just a normal, average, normal dog, and the, the more you got to babysit them. Most what? of these would not survive in the wild. What's the limit? Turn the chihuahuas loose out there. The squirrels would eat them. Okay. Well, what's the there. limit? You said there's a limit. Like, where, where, where is the limit? Like, I would say the limit of the size would be determined by how thick the bone mass can be before it collapses sure. on itself. So I'd say what that since think? elephants can do it, then yes, we could probably produce bone right. structures that are similarly strong in dogs. Right. What man has observed in all of human history is everything we try to selectively breed for, whether it's sweeter apples or bigger apples or, you know, uh, apples that grow in cold climate or warm climate, they've got 1,100 varieties of apples that man has successfully cross, cross, created. They're all still apple, and most of them would not, if you just, like take the dogs, if you turn all the dogs loose in the world into the woods, most would not survive. Natural selection would select the general, and it would go back to the general average ordinary mutt. So my, my, my point is, you guys imagine these family trees, and it's not science. We see dogs produce varieties of dogs, and we see dead ends. We see big ones and little ones. Can't go any further. Ask anybody who breeds dogs. Like my wife has several members of her family and uh, uh, people, relatives, that do this for a living. They will tell you, yeah, there's a limit. It could be the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor, but you believe a dog and a banana have a common ancestor, don't you, Tom? Well, what, what's the limit? So, yes, I believe dogs and bananas have a common ancestor, but you keep saying there's a limit. What's the limit? Because I don't see a limit. Dogs are still getting bigger. I don't, where's the limit? Well, I, I, I guess we'd have to go by what we observe, which is called science. We observe there's a limit. You run into a stone wall. You can't get bigger than a Great Dane. You can't get smaller well, than a Toy Chihuahua. So, we, maybe we've reached the limit. That's they, science. They, they do get bigger. They're getting bigger. What, what do you mean we can't get bigger? They are getting bigger. Oh, get, get one as big as an elephant then. Come on. Well, they get bigger in small amounts, but they are getting bigger. So we're getting there. Give us through, enough years, through, we'll get one that big. Through selective breeding, they've gotten as big as a Great Dane. Okay. Which can still get bigger, so we can get them bigger you think than that, that. You think they can get bigger? They are getting Show bigger. Show me. Where's every, the observation? Every generation, we get bigger ones. Like the, Every right. year, there's a new bigger one. You think they're still getting bigger? Every yes. year they're getting bigger? Yes. Like the, that's why the, the you believe that. Yes. That's you, what we have, we have believe that. competitions okay. for like the largest animal or the tallest animal, and every year they get beaten by a different one because they keep getting bred to be bigger and stronger and faster. Like we have cows now that are just what like one hundred percent muscle to the point where they can't reproduce. So yeah, we've made them so big that they literally can't reproduce on their own anymore. Um, yes, we they can, they're still getting Stop. bigger. Stop and think what you just said. We reached a limit, didn't we? They can't reproduce anymore. Hello. But they're still getting bigger. They, they're continuing to get bigger. Not if they're not reproducing anymore. They're going to die. They can't they have to reproduce babies. They don't live forever. They can't you're, naturally, you're proving my point. Evolution it, doesn't work. Can, uh, so, so they can't naturally reproduce. We artificially reproduce them. Artificial insemination. They're still getting bigger. We're, we're making them even bigger than they are now. Through artificial insemination. Yep. Isn't that going to kill the mommy cow if they get the uh, sperm from the giant bull? There is no. there is a limit. Do you think what? they'll ever get a cow as big as an elephant? Yes, that's also okay. possible. Do you, think, do you think they'll ever get a cow as big as Texas? No. So there is a limit somewhere in there, right? Yeah, the laws of physics mean that atoms can't Bingo. hold themselves okay. together. But that's has the nothing laws to of do physics with and, the, and all, of, all of genetics and all of observation says... There's limits. 339 right. breeds of dogs. That's they not the limit. Never... That's not Texas. 339 breeds is not the size of Texas. So all of evolution is 
yes, we, we agree in evolution there are limits. Like, obviously, you can't break the laws of physics. You can't make a dog that can travel faster than the speed of light, okay? But we can have, like, amoebas go to dogs. That's simpler than creating a dog the size of Texas. So, yes, we, we agree. Evolution, no, you can't make a dog the size of Texas because literally the atoms would not be able to hold themselves together. But you can make an amoeba into a dog because the only difference there is the pattern in the ATCG and the DNA, which is very easy to change, happens all the time. Okay, now wait a minute. You just said, I mean, 415, Alt DV, 415. You just said we can get an amoeba into a dog, I believe is what you said. We go back and play. We have. It's literally oh, happened. We have. we have proof. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying we have turned an amoeba into a dog? Is that your statement? Evolution did, yes. We can prove it, yes. You can prove that? Yes. All we've ever seen is amoeba produce amoeba. I've never seen a non-kent be produced by a kent, but I can still prove it happened. I'd like to see how many lab, how many science laboratories are there. Tell you what, I will give you five hundred dollars if you can get an amoeba to produce a non-amoeba. Well, if I if I could do that in a lab on my own, I'd win a Nobel Prize, which would give me a million. So that would be I, I could get a lot more than five hundred dollars for that. But again, I don't. I only need one lab here. Like I can, I can show a non-kent was produced by a kent with one lab, which is doing DNA testing. You know, I can produce, and I can show an amoeba was went into a dog with the same DNA testing. It only takes one lab to do this. It's just basic evidence. They take a lot of labs. Okay, get all the labs in the world. They they have these That's family right. trees like it's yeah. part of science. Let me go back up here. And they, they call this science. It's not science. To say an amoeba turned to a human or a protozoa turned to a human, all we've ever observed is protozoa produce protozoa, amoeba produce amoeba, humans produce humans. You're choosing to call it an adult and a kid mudding the water. It's still a human. Has any human ever produced a non-human? How many babies have been born in the history of the world, and how many have, have, have turned out to be human? 100% human. I don't understand what you're saying here. So I've I've never observed a Kent produce a non-Kent. I've never observed this happen, but I can still prove it happened. You don't need to directly observe uh, one species evolving to another one. You don't need to observe that. You can prove it happened without observing it. It's called okay. evidence. Stop. DNA. You can prove you can prove an amoeba turned to a dog. Please, yep. what evidence? What evidence do you have for that? This is the, yeah. your debate. You're supposed to show the evidence for evolution. Why would you okay. believe such a dumb thing that an amoeba can turn to a dog? Why do you believe that? Because that hypothesis has made successful novel predictions that have told us many things about the world that we didn't know yet. It was able to predict the future and give us insight into how the world worked before we knew it. And it's the only theory that did that. So it's the only one that any rational person can believe and be justified. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the theory that God said they're always going to bring forth after their kind, when that's what we observe, that's a rational, that's a rational theory. All we've no. ever seen is amoeba produce amoeba and dogs produce dogs, and they don't ever change. Well, that's, again, post hoc rationalization. That's not a prediction. That's people that are goat herders 2,000 years ago looking around them and saying what happens, and then they wrote it down in a book. That's not a prediction. That's a post-diction. So that's not evidence. That's goat herders writing down what they observe. Uh, yeah. And some moron walking around the islands because you can't get a real job named Charlie Darwin sees a bunch of birds, produce a bunch of birds, and says, wow, this proves everything's created. You want to make fun of the goat herders, man. You like to make fun of your stupid religious leader, Charlie Darwin, too. Okay. Well, well that's, so, that's I agree. I agree with you there. So what Darwin said wasn't evidence. What Darwin said was a theory. And then the evidence was when his theory was confirmed. He predicted things, and he got it right. And that was the evidence. So so his just his predictions aren't anything. But at least he made predictions about things we didn't know yet. And then... Well, once he got those right, they were proven correct. That's the evidence, which didn't happen for the okay. Bible. They, they didn't, never has I, that happened. I, I will predict something that we don't know yet. I will predict that if you start with a, a colony of amoeba in a laboratory and, and let them uh, grow and develop and re reproduce for a thousand generations, I will predict it'll still be an amoeba. How's that we for do, a prediction, Tom? We, we do already know that. That's something that's literally been done in a lab. We have like things going on for I'm 50 years. I cannot understand what you are saying. Talk more clearly and enunciate and slow down. What did you say? I said, we have done that. We've literally done that in a lab. Right. Um, I a agree. thousand generations isn't enough to produce a new species. So you're, you're again, that's not a prediction. I just don't think you understand what a prediction is. I understand what a prediction is and a postdiction. Now listen. So they well, then why do you not story. not give any predictions? You keep like if you what, no. give me a prediction because you don't. Okay. I don't think you I do it, know what it is. In the laboratory, you're saying they did a thousand generations of an amoeba, and it was yep. still an amoeba because that's not enough time. Yep. I will predict if you give it ten trillion generations, it'll still be an amoeba. 
Okay, that's a good prediction, but now we would need to confirm it until you confirm it. It's not evidence for your position. So okay. if you do so that, if, if you do the experiment and you prove that after 10 trillion things, no new species is formed, then that would be evidence of your position. But since you haven't done that experiment, it's not evidence of your position. Uh, that's why I said every farmer on the planet that has ever raised anything from corn to potatoes to cows to anything will tell you they always produce the same kind. And that's Which what everybody's ever seen. Since they first started planting wheat and developing it, they've got wheat that grows in dry soil and moist climates, and they've got wheat that'll handle the cold weather, and they've got a whole variety of wheat, but they've still got wheat, 100 different varieties. They can't get out of wheat. It's still wheat. Same thing, let's take the dogs as a classic example. All they ever get are dogs. I predict they'll always get a dog, no exceptions. That's what, that's what every farmer in the history of the world will tell you. But you wish to imagine religious imagination that if it went long enough, these amoeba would produce a non-amoeba. The charts show evidence. the kids in school and amoeba turning into a human. Where's because the scientific evidence. evidence for that? Well, I, How I, many I, generations did that take, Tom, to turn that amoeba to a human? Uh, billions, I think. Billions of generations. Yep. So, so the 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 instead of a turning a frog to a prince with a kiss, you're going to turn the frog to a prince with billions of years. Your magic yep. ingredient is time. But I got DNA. your formula. Let's see. Mutation in DNA, which we can again prove. So I don't, I don't okay. understand the problem here. There you go. I'll send you one if you'd like. If you add millions of years, that'll work. If that doesn't work, try billions of years. Tom, it doesn't work with trillions or quadrillions or quintillions or sextillions of years. It won't work. Yeah, it's it not we can prove science. It you we believe it, it would happen, you imagine it might happen, but that's not science. Where's the scientific evidence that an amoeba turned to a human? Well, the we books can... are being, the kids are being taught that. Where's the science? I've already answered that many times and I was correct with all my answers before, but as you mentioned, the thousand experiments that we've done, the thousand generations of bacteria, we can measure the rate of genetic change in those things. And then we can plot out the rate and show, oh, look, if this rate continues over billions of years, yes, we can get uh, dogs from amoebas. So yeah, we, we've literally proven that we can do that in exactly the time frame predicted by evolution. Um, we don't need, we don't need um, like billions of the planets, only 4.5 billion predict years old. I predict that cows can be trained to jump higher and higher if you work them out, put them in the gym, and make them lift weights, et cetera, and you, a cow can jump. Therefore, if we work hard enough, a cow can jump over the moon. That's what you are saying, Tom. No, it's not yes, all Yes, you I'm are. Saying. No. All we so, ever so, see is amoeba produce amoeba. Which I've already explained. I never see a kent produce a non-Kent, but I can still prove it. Again, you, you keep being confused because you think you need to directly observe this. I mean, we can directly observe micro macro evolution in lab. We have done this, but you don't accept that. So it's not really, I can prove that too, but we don't need to. Like you keep saying, we haven't observed a non-cow come from a cow. Well, I haven't observed a non-Kent come from a Kent. I don't need to. Like we can prove it's true without directly observing it. So you saying we don't, we haven't directly observed it doesn't disprove anything. I can still prove it's true. I don't need to directly observe it. Science is what we observe, study, yes. test. Like what, what I just said, yes. Okay. In the lab, they've been raising amoeba and bacteria and all kinds of things for, let's, let's say the history of really modern science goes back a few hundred years when they had microscopes the last three or 400 years to be able to do this kind of, see the, even see these kind of things. So we've observed for a couple hundred years these bacteria or amoeba or protozoa in the laboratory and they've done cultures on them and they've raised who knows how many quadrillions of them. Have they ever gotten in a, a protozoa, or let's take an amoeba, have they ever gotten an amoeba to produce a non-amoeba? An amoeba to prove, again, I don't need to prove that. I can just show that does the DNA change? Yes, I've proven it. So I don't need to observe this. I can prove it through looking at the pattern in the DNA, just like I can prove okay. a non-Kent came from Kent without ever seeing it. Does it has a lab ever taken a non-Kent and produced a Kent or a Kent and produced a non-Kent? No, it's never happened in a lab. Can I prove it true though? Yes, I can still look at your DNA and prove Kent produced a non-Kent, just like I can no. prove other animals. You cannot, you cannot prove any such thing. You can imagine. All we've ever seen is kids produce kids. Kids produce what? kids? Well, adults, humans produce humans. So you're mudding the water with kids and adults. Humans produce humans. That we can observe. I got three myself, okay? And right. they've got, <laughs> I got a bunch of grandkids. So 
that, that, I mean, I, I'd be willing to predict when my grandkids get married and have babies, they will be human. I'll predict that. I'll bet you 20, I'll bet you 100 bucks on that one. Great. And I, I've already disproven that point and you haven't addressed it. So I can prove a Kent can produce a non Kent and I don't need to observe it. So, so that's your argument. You've never, maybe observed, I'm, I'm, uh, one maybe, sec, you, you never I'm observed. I'm not understanding what you're saying. Are you saying a Kent, K E N T, yeah. or a kid, K I D? Kent, you, Kent, Kent Hoven, Kent, a Kent produces a non-Kent. Kent produces Eric. Eric is not Kent. Kent produces a non-Kent. And that is your evidence that an amoeba turned to a human? No. no Tom, that's what planet my, are you living no, on no, anyway, no, son? No, no, that's not my my argument here is that your argument is silly, and I can prove your argument is silly. So your argument <laughs> is, is that we've never seen I don't think a, you'll find, oh, you will oh, find oh, a oh, sane oh, person in me, the world who me, will believe what you just said. Let me try to explain here. So, so your argument is, is that we've never seen a cow produce a non-cow. That's now, correct. let me let me take that argument. I'm going to reframe the structure here and use the exact same structure of your argument. And let's see how silly your argument is. I've never observed a Kent produce a non-Kent, just like I've never observed a cow produce a non-cow. But I can still prove both in the exact same way by looking at the DNA. I can look at the DNA of your kids and compare it to yours and be like, oh, look, a Kent has produced a non-Kent. There's evidence of this. So I can believe that you, a Kent, has produced a non-Kent by looking at the evidence, just like I can prove that a cow or an amoeba has produced a non-amoeba by looking at the DNA evidence. So I can be justified in both without ever having to see a Kent produce a non-Kent because I can look at the DNA, which is the evidence. So, so I, don't, I don't need to see a Kent produce a non-Kent. I just need okay. to see the DNA. Right. I think we are I think we are watching visible evidence that our public school produces morons. Well, I mean, I didn't go to public school, so I, I think you've lost. Okay. Uh, you can believe whatever you wish to believe, okay? This is Evidence. not science. It's true. Kent produced a non-Kent. Therefore, amoebas and mosquitoes and whales are related. What kind of logic is that? So if a Kent can uh, produce a non-Kent... I am a human being. I have the same number of chromosomes as my son. There are differences. I have more blonde hair. He has more red hair. Okay? So we're still human. This is not evidence that cows and bananas are related. You guys want all the kids to be taught that everything is related. That's not science. It's an imagination. And uh, you didn't offer evidence. Well, a Kent produced a non-Kent. Tom, that argument is stupid. Yes, I'm it a is. human. Yes, I produced yes, it a is. human. It's very stupid because it's your argument. And I'm just mirroring it to show how stupid your argument is. Yes, I agree it's a stupid argument because it's yours. Show me a show me a human that produced a non-human, and let's word the, use the word human, and talk slowly so I can understand you. Like again, what on so, earth? so I don't. I, again, the whole point here is I'm mirroring your argument. I'm trying to show you that your own argument is stupid by sh taking your argument and replacing the nouns. Like I don't need. I, I've never seen a Kent produce a non-Kent, but can I still have evidence? Even though I've never seen it, can I still have evidence? It's true. Yes. So, so the fact that I've seen it, this, what this proves is that whether or not I've actually seen a Kent produce a non-Kent doesn't matter to the argument because there's other things that count as evidence here. So whether or not I've seen an amoeba evolve into a cow doesn't matter. For the same reason it doesn't matter if I've seen a Kent produce a non-Kent because there's this other thing that works as evidence. It's called, called DNA. I don't, I don't need to see it if I have the other evidence. Okay, so you saw a Kent produce a non-Kent, and therefore, because we have probably differences in our DNA, therefore, mosquitoes and whales are related. That's your logical conclusion from that? No. From Kent produced a no. non-Kent. Well, no. the purpose of the debate is for you to provide evidence for evolution. Where right. is, I finally found the slides, for, slide number 1415, Alt-DV, 1415, okay. There are 50 varieties of what? Put my slides up. Put my slides up. Hey, wake up over there. There are 50 varieties of watermelons. I predict they had a common ancestor. I predict they will always produce watermelons. The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. There are 500 to maybe 1,000 varieties of mangoes. They probably had a common ancestor. They produced after their kind. 2,500 varieties of apples. They are always going to produce an apple. Okay? Yeah. Always. How many wasps are there? 17,000 species of wasps. Wow. 3,000 varieties of tomatoes. All we've ever seen is they produce the same kind. Where's the evidence of anything other than that? A Kent produced a non-Kent. Is that going to be your argument? Uh, no, that's your argument. I'm trying to show why your argument... I'll...
easily fails and we can prove your argument fails. So like you're saying the fact that we've never seen a non cow produce a cow is evidence that it's never happened. That's, that's, that's your argument. And so I could use the same argument and say the fact I've never seen a Kent produce a non Kent is evidence. It's never happened. Now you could say, well, that's silly. See, see, you don't need to, you don't need to have seen my child being born to know he's my child. There's a different way. You don't, you don't need to see it. There's a different way to show this has happened. And that's with this thing called DNA. We can, we can do ancestry tests and be like, oh, look, his DNA has the same mutations as your DNA. And so you're related. And since we can do the same thing with animals, we don't need to see it happen because it's happened over a long time frame. We can't literally see long time frames, but we can still know it happened in the exact same way we know that Eric is your son by comparing the DNA. So the whole point of the Kent and non-Kent thing is that we don't need to see it, Kent. I've disproven your argument. I don't know why you keep repeating that. Okay. Now, focus, Daniel San. Listen carefully. There are 7,500 varieties of apples. I bet they have very similar DNA. There may be some differences in the DNA of the apples. I don't know. Actually, I don't care. But I'd be willing to bet they're always going to be an apple. So because there's differences in the DNA between the different kinds of apples, therefore, apples are related to pigs. That's your logic. No. So, so I'm saying that there are patterns in both the apples and the pigs that are the same, just like there's patterns between Eric and you that are the same. So the, the, the patterns in the separate species, both the pigs and the apples, is the same. Okay. They have the same ERV, same endogenous pressure viruses in the exact same location, right. same DNA. So we can know they're related in the same way we know all of your kids are related. So we know okay. Eric and I, I don't know the early kid's right. name. Those are the, they're both related to you because they have the same patterns at the same location, the same pattern in the DNA structure. So we know they came from the same I, parents. And we do the same thing with right. pigs and apples and amoebas. Okay. I will confess that my son and I uh, and uh, had a common ancestor, grandpa and great-grandpa. And I'm embarrassed to say it, but you and I probably have a common ancestor also, if we go back far enough. We're still human. The apples that we see have a common ancestor called an apple. Sure, there's variations of the DNA. You might get red ones or green ones or yellow ones or big ones or little ones or sour ones or sweet ones, but they're always apple. There are 17,000 species of wasps. Might have had a common ancestor. That doesn't prove wasps are related to tomatoes. There might be DNA similarities. That could prove a common designer. That's a different argument. I don't know. All I know is all science has ever observed is tomatoes produce tomatoes. Farmers, they do it, you get a new crop every year. Now with Kent producing Eric, that took, well, it didn't take very long to produce him, but raising him took a long time. Uh, so <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, so I think that we, we get a new generation time for tomatoes every year. Wow, so in one human lifetime, we could observe you know 70 different generations. You couldn't do that with humans. So let's take something with a shorter time frame like amoebas. Do you believe there's evidence that amoebas be produced a non-amoeba? I, I, I know you do. You think an amoeba turned to a human, and you think they should put those charts in the school because they drew a line between the human going back to an amoeba. Amoebas have a real short generation time. One scientist in the laboratory could probably, in, in a 30-year lifespan, watch thousands of generations of amoeba. Where is the evidence that an amoeba ever produced a non-amoeba? Google it. Has an amoeba ever produced a non-amoeba? So yes. far, no, but we're going to keep trying. Someday it'll happen. Okay, well, until then, it's not science. No, again, so I've, I've already proved that wrong, like to the point where any child, like it's like at least above five can understand this. You don't need to directly observe it to prove it happened. You can prove it happened in other ways. And so I've, I've de debunked your argument there, Ken. You, you've lost that point. Wait, wait, wait. It could happen another way. What other way is it? Where's the evidence of a watermelon producing a non-watermelon? They got itty bitty uh, ones the size of a grape. Uh, no, no, okay, okay I'll, I'll say it. I'll say it slower for you. So, so try, try to try to listen. No, not only Even, slower, but make you use some common sense wait, this wait. time. Go ahead. Well, well, the problem is, is you didn't understand the words I said. That's I don't think you comprehended the sentence and the argument there. So the argument is, is that we don't need to directly observe it happening. There are other ways to prove it happened other than directly observing it. This is a thing in science called indirect observation, which is a kind of observation. So we can prove that Eric is your son in a different way other than seeing it happen. We don't need to see it happen 
to prove it happened. We can prove it happened in a different way. So you keep saying we've never seen evolution happen. We, we have, right. but that's a different topic. But that doesn't matter because we can prove it in other ways. We can look Correct. at the patterns in the DNA. So if we look There's at the patterns in the DNA. There's only two people who saw Eric get created. We close right. the door, okay? Right. Yes. Which yeah. means I've never seen it. So I've never seen Eric being created. Right. But can I prove it? Can I prove it still happened? Sure. Okay. So how, what how, way, how do what I do way, that? The Bible, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Wait, what, what way? Wait, wait, wait. I, you prove... a question. I had a question. How, how would I prove that Eric was your son? We are both human. We both fit the category of mankind. How would you, I'd rather take it to divert it to something more common sense. How would you prove wasps and tomatoes whoa, whoa, are related? Wait, I had a question here. So this is, this is a specific question I'm asking you. Don't, don't, try to, don't try to diverge. Don't try to avoid the crushing argument that's going to destroy your entire position. How would I prove that Eric is your son? Well, there could be DNA testing to prove Eric is my son. So, but I never saw it happen. I never saw a Kent produce a non Kent. It's never been done in a lab. No one in the lab has ever produced a Kent from a non Kent. Therefore, it's a lie. Completely not evidence because no. it doesn't matter because I've never seen Calm a Kent come from a non Kent. Calm down, Tom. In any court of law, there are different types of evidence. There is direct evidence, there is indirect evidence, there is uh, 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 inference, and they have different weights that they carry in law. We could see probably the DNA code of all these different uh, tomatoes. I have enough similarities that we could say maybe all the tomatoes had a common ancestor. That does not prove tomatoes and wasps have a common ancestor. You are wildly jumping to conclusions, trying to include your religious belief that everything had a common ancestor. Nobody designed it. You're, you're wildly jumping to the conclusion to try to avoid the obvious that God said they bring forth after their kind. You don't like that. Okay. Lump it. He said they bring forth after their kind. That's all we've ever seen. Kent Hovind, a human being, produced Eric Hovind, a human being, and he produced his kids, a human being. That's it. That's not proof we're related to apples. There is no direct or indirect, certainly no indirect ev or direct evidence. It, you can imply this if you want. Wow, look at this. They're both eukaryotes. Wow. You know, apples and humans are both attracted by gravity. Oh, that proves they're related. That's the kind of dumb logic you evolutionists follow. <laughs> This is insane. Where's the scientific evidence that everything is related, Tom? You're the one who believes this stuff. You believe? Do you believe you're related to an apple? Yes, I am related to apples. I believe it too. <laughs> Congratulations, you've accepted evolution. I win the debate. Okay, let me <laughs> let me jump in, guys. This has been a great debate. We've got over 420 people in the chat. Uh, you know, many calling this historical. So it's definitely been a ton of fun. The timer for the discussion went off about five minutes ago. So we had about okay. a 35 minute <laughs> discussion. I really just didn't know where to jump in. Uh, great uh, discussion and dialogue, guys. Let's move into some closing statements. Uh, Tom started off the discussion, so we'll let uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kent end it. Uh, Tom, we're going to hand it over to you for a five minute concluding statement. Then Kent will give you a five minute uh, concluding statement. Then we'll get into some audience questions. So Tom, floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I, I demonstrated why Kent's argument doesn't work with his own words there. He's like, oh, you've never observed it happen in a lab. And I said, well, there's other ways to show evidence and it's the DNA pattern. And then when I flipped his argument on him, I said, I've never seen in a lab a Kent produce a non-Kent. He admitted that there's this other kind of evidence that you don't literally need to see it happen if you have this other kind of evidence called DNA testing. So he admitted that we can, we can, we can discover this in other ways. We don't need to see it in a lab. So it kind of undermined his entire point and he admitted it and and then just to put a cherry on top he admitted that i'm related to apples which proves evolution so thank you all right i appreciate the uh closing statement there tom short and sweet uh we also did just set a new record we got 425 people live the previous rec uh, record was another debate with kent on end times theology where we had about 420 live so great job uh keeping this a fun debate so kent we're gonna hand it over to you brother uh five minute concluding statement whenever you are ready all right so by tom's logic if i observe him being a careless driver for 10 seconds that proves he created every accident in the world there are about 60 different kinds of oak trees in the United States. They might have had a common ancestor. 195 varieties of chickens, eight kinds of bears, 50 varieties of watermelons, 7,500 varieties of apples. Okay, 
I accept the fact that there are variations of all these things. I think it's evidence they had a common creator, not a common ancestor, okay? 45 varieties of pumpkins, I accept that. 111 varieties of pine trees, okay? 12,000 varieties of grass, whoa, okay? 150 species of roses and a bunch of hybrids. 60 species of rats. 1,000 species of sharks and rays. New species discovered every year, I agree with that. 60 species of eagles. I accept all that. That is science. Anything inside that circle is religion. It is not observable that eagles have a common ancestor with sharks. You can believe that if you want. I don't see how you can't see this, the idiocy of your logic. I accept the fact that cows can jump. They can be trained to jump higher if you work them out. Therefore, cows can jump over the moon if we wait long enough. This is your logic. I, I think evolution, as I stand my ground, evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religious cult in the history of the world. You can believe you're related to an apple if you want. Do you eat them? Are you eating your relatives? Whoa. You believe you came from a rock, which is what evolution teaches. The earth cooled down, had a hard rocky crust. It rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. Tom, do you drive on the highway and run over your ancestors? <sighs> I think... Evolution has got to be the dumbest and most dangerous idea mankind has ever come up with. It's a desperate attempt to get away from the obvious fact God created the world. There's no other explanation. There's no other explanation than to say some human mind, some man created this ink pen. There's just, there isn't a good natural explanation to leave man out of the equation. There's no natural explanation to explain the salt shaker. Even though it's made of clay, which is right here in my gravel pit, There, you can't say this thing made itself. They, they, it doesn't, there's, there is no naturalistic explanation within the clay to create the salt shaker. There's no natural explanation within the, the dirt to create man. Now, God can take the dirt and make man. Man can take the dirt and make pottery out of the clay. Man can take iron ore and make a car. But the iron ore can't make a car by itself. You guys want so badly to leave God out of the equation. Okay, we'll see how that works for your judgment day. I did my best. I tried. Go ahead. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Dino, that concludes the closing statements. Again, fantastic debate. Tons of fun. Uh, time flies by. So let's get in about 15 to 20 minutes worth of audience questions. We have a ton here. So what we'll do as we usually do is... Uh, whoever the question is for, we'll make sure they get the last word. Uh, Tom, let's say the question's for you. We'll let you respond. Kent can uh, add in a few points. Then we'd give Tom the last word. Okay, so let's uh, pick the first question that came in all the way at the beginning. And also, I want to thank everybody for their super chats and comments. Um, okay, here we go. So this first one comes in from Rebel Nazarene, and it looks like this question is for you, Tom. So Rebel asks, ask Tom, how can the law of entropy and evolution both be true? They are opposite phenomenon. Uh, go ahead. Uh, they are not opposite phenomenon. Entropy is just the state that usable energy decreases over time. Uh, Evolution is an added set of organization which does take energy, but as long as there's some other source emitting more energy than it takes to build the organization and evolution, then entropy is conserved because there's more energy being lost than gained. So the fact that we have this big thing called the sun, which emits tons and tons of energy, um, there's excess energy sent off by the sun then is required to produce the organization and evolution. Therefore, the net system of the solar system is still losing more energy than it's gaining, um, even though in certain pockets of it where heat and chemical interactions happen, there is some organization being gained. The overall amount of entropy is still decreasing because, or increasing, because the amount of energy is being lost because the amount the sun is emitting is far more than the amount required to do evolution. It's very simple. All right, I appreciate it there, uh, Tom. Uh, we'll hand it over to Kent. If there's anything you wanted to add, go ahead. Well, yeah, uh, he has demonstrated great faith to believe that the sun's energy is going to somehow make these changes. What we've seen is the law of entropy. Everything seems to, seems to be falling apart. Everything degrades. The more the gene code is multiplied and the, the DNA, we're, get, we're gathering a genetic load. 
mankind today has a genetic load much greater than a thousand years ago. There's all kinds of defects in our genes. They're slowly, if you took a piece of paper with anything written on it and ran it through the copier, then you took the copy and ran it through the copy, a copier, and you made a copy of the copy of the copy. You go about 20 or 30 generations, you won't be able to read it. The, we've, we're about probably four or five, three or 400 generations from Adam, and our DNA code is degrading. It's not improving. And so the law of entropy is true. Adding more sunlight is going to make it worse. You're going to get a sunburn. So it, there, it's, to, to, to add energy doesn't help. Dropping a hand grenade into a, a, a pile of sticks will not build a house. Adding energy, it takes intelligence to take the sticks and turn them into something useful. It takes intelligence to get the clay out of the ground and turn it into a salt shaker. It takes intelligence, okay? It does not take intelligence to graduate from school these days, but it does take intelligence to build things, okay? So I rest my case, go ahead. Thank you there, uh, Dr. Dino and Tom. Question was for you, if you want a final word, go ahead. Oh yeah, we can obviously see things are growing in com complexity, like all life is grows, you start from a kid form and then you grow and add complexity to your life form. Crystals add complexity from the beginning. Things organize uh, all the time. If you add energy to the system, it can organize if there's excess energy in the system. So this is, it's pretty obvious how this is possible. Life can organize in the system if excess energy is being added to it by like, oh, I don't know, the sun. Okay, thanks for that final word there, Tom. Moving on to the next question. This one comes in from Born 100 Years Late. I've got it up on screen here. And again, the question is for you, T-Jump. So he asks, 1,000 generations isn't enough time for one change. How many changes are necessary for a completely new kind? And he just says, do the math. How does this fit in your timeline? Uh, uh, yeah, so it depends. Like, there's no such thing as a kind. That's just a made-up definition by creationists. There are different kinds of species, and different kinds of species have been produced in a lab. Like, there's been the longest experiment on evolution. Uh, I think it's gone on since I was born, 33 years or so, where they've done continuous uh, different generational changes to E. coli and the like, the, some of the fastest reproducing bacteria in order to test evolution. And they have produced many different species of of bacteria. So yes, we we've literally seen it happen. A thousand. I mean, each generation has changes. Like there are tens of thousands of changes and mutations in every generation. Uh, but, but to create a new species takes more depending on your definition of species. And science has proven this in a lab. We, we know what causes different species and it happens all the time. Um, I don't, there's not like a specific number. It's just based on when do the changes happen um, enough to produce a new functionality that can't, makes it a different kind of a thing, like going from a single celled organism to a multi celled organism, which we have also observed happen in the lab. So, I mean, it's not like a specific number. There's just like an on average, this is the amount it takes given the environmental factors, but it, it definitely happens. I don't know the exact number, but we've, we've seen it happen many times. Okay, over to Kent for your response. Another clear demonstration of his faith, his religion. He believes it could happen if we give it enough time. This isn't science. I think in science class, we should teach science. I think in math class, they should teach math. History class, teach history. Evolution is not science. It's a religious belief that if we gave it more generations, the question is very legitimate, a thousand generations isn't enough time. How many would it take? I covered a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to find my slides now, I got about 80,000 slides. There, there's no good definition of species. There are 21 different definitions of species now. What exactly is a species? Is a dog and a wolf a different species? Yes. Can they still interbreed? Yeah. Well. So the, the, he said the creation is made up the word kind. No, God made up that. He said 10 times in the first chapter, they're going to bring forth after their kind. That's all we've ever seen is dogs produce dogs. Cows produce cows. Anybody wishes to believe something other than that is welcome to believe it, but it's not science. Here we go, 537. Almost found it. 537. Enter. Mankind has played around with the gene code and selectively bred different kinds of corn, different kinds of dogs, 12,000 species of grass in the family, in, in the world. There's still grass, there's still a plant. You think they'll ever, with enough generations, if we give it 20 trillion generations, will they turn grass into an elephant? You believe they would, but that's not science. That's a religion. I wish you guys could admit you have a religious belief and stop pretending it is science. Thank you for the response there, Kent. And T-Jump, again, question was for you. Go ahead, final word. Uh, my faith in evolution is equal to my faith that a Kent produced a non-Kent. And so if, if he thinks that's faith, then I guess I guess, I guess so. 
Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for the engagement on that good question. So next one comes in short and sweet. This comes in from Bubblegum Gun. I appreciate the super chat and the support. So question again is for you, uh, T Jump. So he asks, can a Chihuahua evolve into a wolf? If so, do it. So there you go. He's challenging you. <laughs> yes, yes, it can. Can you donate all of your money to my bank account? If so, do it. All right, thank you. There you go. Uh, there's a challenge out there for you. Bubblegum gun. So over to you, okay. uh, Dr. Dino. Uh, anything you'd okay. like to add? I suspect that the original dog kind, let's call it a wolf, maybe it was something like a wolf, has been selectively bred down to the Chihuahua, and they might have lost now a lot of their original genetic code. They didn't gain anything. They lost to where you probably could take all the chihuahuas and crossbreed them and get you know a little closer back, but you, you, I don't think you're ever going to go all the, all the way back to a wolf. If it happened, it'd still be a dog kind. It didn't, didn't prove nothing. So they wasted a lot of money making the stupid chihuahua. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Uh, T-Jump, final word? Oh, I'm good. Okay, here we go. Next question comes in from Endo. $5 Super Chat. Again, I appreciate the support. Endo asks, Kent. So question for you there, Ken. How similar does DNA need to be to show that we have a common relative? He says, are chimps DNA similar enough? Neanderthals, for example, or it only works for your son? Well, I know it worked for my son. Uh, I think in a, a court of law, they would try to look at DNA. And say, you know, there are limits to this. How much can you prove? I think you'd. I think we could prove that probably you know, humans from Asia and humans from uh, Africa and humans from uh, North America have a common ancestor if you go back far enough. I think his name was Adam. I even know his wife's name, Eve. And I know where they lived, yeah, Garden of Eden. So that's as far as we can take it. Humans produce humans. Somebody, one of my people said, uh, uh, Kent produced a non-Kent. Well, did you expect an exact clone? Uh, what do you expect out of this? Good, good observation. So yes, um, I think that the DNA it, there's a lot of variety within the DNA. You can take the English letters, the 26 English letters, and rearrange them and produce thousands of words. But you're never going to get Chinese out of there. It's not available. Go ahead. Thank you, Ken. I don't, I don't think he answered the question. Like The question was, is what is the limitation here? How, how would, in a court of law, if they look at your DNA and your son's DNA and say, yes, you're related, and they look at uh, a chimpanzee DNA and a dolphin DNA, why would they not also say they're related? What, what, what point of the similarity in the DNA are they gonna, is the court of law going to be like, nah, not related, even though they have the same patterns? Well, I've got, I'm in the middle of my library here with thousands of books. I think we could prove all of them have the same 26 letters of the alphabet for their code to write the book. Therefore, all these books have the same author. That's your logic. Look, they got the same same 26 letters. Aha, proof of the same author. Of course, there are limits. Yes, you can rearrange the words of, of the 26 letters and get a lot of different words. That's the code everybody in English writes with, the same 26 letters. I bet we could find similar uh, sentences in some of these books. So it, it's not proving a common ancestor. That's the code with which you write it. The fact that chimpanzees have a few similarities with humans doesn't prove common ancestry. Microsoft Word has a lot of identical lines of code to Microsoft PowerPoint. That doesn't prove they came from Morse code. That proves the same guys are reusing some of the code. So God used some of the code to make fingers in humans. And guess what? Chimpanzees have fingers. Whoa. Let's use the same code to develop, tell the body to develop a finger. It doesn't prove ancestry. Same designer wrote the code. Chevy puts round tires on their trucks and on their cars. That's proof they came from a skateboard. All right. I appreciate uh, the answers there and responses on a good question. Also, a uh, disclaimer to the audience. We got a lot of great uh, super chats, and I appreciate that. But any super chat that uh, comes with either an ad hom towards the debaters or uh, even an off-topic question, uh, I, I can't ask those. So I appreciate the support, but we're not going to ask those types of questions. So. Here's the next question. This one comes in from Redefine Living. This question is for, um, looks like it's for you there, Tom. So he asks, question, did evolution predict that endogenous retroviruses would have function before these specific functions were found? 
Yes. So uh, function as defined by the encode project is just any binding kind of thing. And so, yes, we predicted that the ERVs and pretty much every pattern in DNA would have a function and that it would bind to other molecules in DNA. They don't have any coding function. They don't code for anything, but they do have a function in the fact that they do bind with other molecules. So, yes, those are that was predicted by evolution a long time ago. OK, thank you, Tom, for the response. Uh, Kent, anything you wanted to add? I disagree completely. The evolution of religion was invented way before they ever heard of an ERV. Now, everything that is discovered since Darwin came up with this dumb idea somehow has to be shoehorned into this dumb religion. So anything they find will be forced to fit that, that, that theory. So no, he is not correct. ERVs weren't even heard of, weren't even thought, never, never discovered until way after Darwin's religion was invented. So he is mistaken. Thank you. And uh, T-Jump, question was for you. Final word. Apparently, if Darwin didn't do it, it's not a prediction by evolution. I, I have never heard of this. I've never heard that all predictions must have been made by the first writing and the first version of the first theory by the guy who wrote it or else it doesn't count. This is a new thing. Again, this must be in this creationist document of new definitions I haven't heard of. i got to find this creationist book of, of new definitions. It's got some really interesting stuff in there. Okay, well, I appreciate it. Let's get to the next question here, man. This chat is flying. So let me see if I can find it again. Um, actually, no, I got it up on screen here. So uh, $10 super chat comes in from William Jacksonville, Jackson Y. I appreciate it. So question is for, uh, I guess it's for you, uh, T-Jump. So he, he says, Kent is a name of a human. So yes, he produces humans, but yes, he could name him Kent. So I don't know, I guess... Can't produce He's, he's saying a humans. Kent could produce a Kent rather than a non-Kent, which w would be fine. I mean, because the whole point of my argument was that has a Kent ever produced a non-Kent and do we have reason to believe it other than the fact we have never seen it? So even if Kent did produce a Kent, like an exact copy or just named his kid Kent, that would still be evidence to my argument because the, the argument is, is do we have evidence that Kent produced a non-Kent even though we haven't seen it? And the answer is yes which means we also have evidence that an amoeba can produce a fish, even though we haven't seen it. Okay. All right. Actually, yes, I did produce a Kent. My first son is named Kent. Okay. Then I produced a non-Kent named Eric. <laughs> then I produced a daughter. Whoa. Now what are we going to do? Gee whiz. They're very different. They're all human, Tom. Human. That doesn't prove we're related to mosquitoes. I still don't think you were following the argument there. It's, oh, it's, I follow uh, it. I think it's retarded. Go ahead. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. All right. You guys are making for a good debate. So here we go. I appreciate good question and good super chat. And thank you for the answer there, Dr. Olvin. So next one that comes in. Now we got one for you, Tom. So good um, mix of questions, it looks like at this point. So this one is from Landon Freeman. So he asks, Venom has allegedly evolved roughly 30 times independently. I think he's pointing to convergent evolution. How can a goalless, mindless process like evolution be so consistent, repeatedly reintroduce, reintroducing biological feature? Uh, because it's determined by the laws of physics, so they come up with similar patterns. And so if, if the environment is beneficial in the environment, then it will more likely evolve in something that's detrimental in the environment. And so because it's determined by physical patterns and structures, some things will more likely evolve than others. And so we'll see patterns like legs and lungs and eyes. Yes, th those the things that are beneficial will evolve more often. Okay, um, thank you. Over to you, Dr. Ovin. Wishful thinking. I think the venom and, and the method to inject it, like let's take a rattlesnake, for example. The, the, the whole system of injecting the venom that a rattlesnake puts in is a really complicated system. It has heat sensing organs that can see in the, it can sense the heat in the dark to find the prey, bite it, inject the venom. And it has to be constantly reproducing this new venom. So I think just this, the venom production system, whether it's a mosquito or a wasp or a rattlesnake or a black widow spider, is mind boggling in its complexity. You'd almost think there was a designer if you hadn't gone to public school. And I think it was for, yeah, it was for you, Tom. You can have a quick final word. That's fine. Okay, let's move on. We got a ton of super chats coming in here, guys. So we're gonna get through these last three and, um, and call it there, time is flying by. So this next one comes in from S W E and okay, we got it up on screen. 
Uh, chat is wild. So I appreciate the lively chat. Okay. $10 super chat. I appreciate it from SWE. This one is for you, Dr. Hoven. So she asks, what does Kent think about the fact that studies have shown the single celled ancestor of animals likely already had some of the mechanisms that animal cells use to develop into different tissue types? Well, if I understand the question correctly, the single celled organism, let's take it and call it an amoeba, already had the mechanisms to make an arm and an eye and a brain and a nervous system and a skeletal system and a muscular system. I completely disagree. I don't know where they went to school, but whoever taught them that lied to them, they should get their money back. Amoeba are incredibly complicated. One amoeba is more complicated than the space shuttle. One amoeba. And all they've ever produced is a baby amoeba. So if an amoeba has the DNA code that happens to match some of the DNA code of a different animal, so that's the same designer. Ne neither one is actually provable in a court of law. So why do we all pay for one religion to be taught? Let's just ignore the subject, teach biology in biology class. And forget evolution is not part of science. It's certainly not part of biology. Thank you there, Dr. Dino. And uh, Tom, You, if you want anything to, anything to add, go ahead. Oh, Tom, I think you're on mute. Sorry. You muted me, God damn it. But I think that, I don't think Kent answered the question like last time. Like, I think he's just, he, he hasn't really answered the questions that people are asking. He's just kind of like avoiding them. I don't know. I don't get it. Okay, over to you, uh, Kent, for your uh, last word on that. Uh, no, that's fine. I think, uh, stand by, stand, uh, let's see, seven, nine. Uh, there. Uh, no, we've never seen an amoeba produce a non-amoeba. That's just, it's nonsense. It's non-science. It's religious belief. It's imagination. It's SpongeBob to believe it can happen. That's fine. And even if it did happen, even if it's true, we couldn't prove it scientifically. So it's, it's outside the realm of science. And the topic of the debate, if you go back and read it, Tom, is... Where's the scientific evidence for evolution? There isn't any. None. I win. Let's go home. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, last two super chats here. And anybody who, who brings in any more super chats, I apologize. We do got to wrap this up at some point. So Canadian Catholic, $5 super chat. I appreciate it. This is a question for both. So we'll get both your input in on this one. Uh, Canadian Catholic asks, do you think old earth creationism is a good bridge between evolution and creation. Uh, Tom, we can start with you if you'd like, since <laughs> Kent started with the last one. Uh, sure, I'd say no. I'd say it's mostly post hoc reasoning. We're after the young earth creationist view, which is the predominant view in Christianity for a long time, got debunked by evolution and proven wrong. Uh, the Christian worldview shifted to try and make it fit the scientific data, which happens a lot, God of the gaps, after many of the Christian things that have been proven wrong over and over and over again. They change their view to try and make it fit science, which shows that science is better than the Bible and it tells us more about reality and religion just has to fit the science, not the other way around. So I don't, I mean, it's, it's better in the fact that it more corresponds to the things we know in reality, but it's not a better hypothesis because again, it's just post hoc fitting the data that science discovered. Okay, over to you, uh, Dr. Dino, for your response. Well, he is dreaming when he says it got debunked, so they tried to change a new theory. I've never changed mine. From the, God never changed it from the very beginning. He said he made it all in six days. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. The Bible says nothing died till man sinned. God made a perfect world, and man messed it up. And someday God's going to fix it back like it used to be, and I'm looking forward to that. But no, there's never uh, that it's never been debunked. So there's no reason to try to compromise this dumb evolution theory with the common sense obvious evidence. Somebody had to create this. Well, adding billions of years is not going to help. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Catholics are teaching there might be a gap. It might be millions of years in there. Well, then they're calling Jesus a liar. He said that was the beginning. The Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. God wrote it on a rock with his finger. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. They're calling God a liar. I completely disagree. There's no reason to try to compromise at all. 6,000 years is a long time. Plenty to put everything in that happened in the world, and especially when you include a big flood to make all the fossils and all the layers and all the canyons, one giant flood. The Bible says the scoffers in the last days would be ignorant of the creation and the flood. We got demonstrated here tonight, live on screen. Go ahead. Thank you for the response, Kent and Tom. Last super chat for the night. Uh, that I can get to here comes in from Logan Missyak, $10. I appreciate the support. And this one is for you, T-Jump. 
So I've got it up on screen and we can read it together here. So he asks, if I kill a deer, am I killing my family member? Because we have some similar DNA. Are humans bananas? What is your state? Well, I guess there's a few questions in there. Uh, you know, take your time, choose whatever you'd like to respond to there, Tom. Sure. Uh, deers are related to humans in that they came from a common ancestor. They are just very distantly related. Humans are related to bananas. They're not literally bananas, except if you ask Ray Comfort. Uh, what is your standard of truth? My standard of truth is justified true belief and novel testable predictions is how I know right from wrong. I assume he means correct true facts and false facts, or if it means moral facts, I believe there is an objective morality. Um, I think it's the best of all possible worlds, and it's defined as a world where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing, and that is a morally better world than anything in any religious text, uh, especially the drowning babies and the sending bears to kill kill kids for making fun of a bald guy. Like, clearly, my model's better than the, the God of the Old Testament. Okay, over to you, uh, Kent, if there's anything you'd like to add to it. I caught about a third of that. Uh, I had to go back and listen carefully. If I kill a deer, am I killing my family member? Absolutely not. It's okay. Up on our deer feeder, we've got a sign. This corn is for squirrels. Any deer caught eating this corn will be shot. Yeah. We do have some similar DNA. we got a common ancestor. Are humans bananas? No. Okay? Not at all. What's your standard of truth? I have a standard. I have a tape measure to measure when I'm going to do carpentry work. I have a standard of inches. I can measure things or feet. I've got a standard for right and wrong. There are standards of weight. There are standards of speed. There are all kinds of standards we use in science. Evolution doesn't have a standard. How do you tell right from wrong? Great question. I think the creator who created this world gave us the standard to judge things by. Is it wrong to kill another human? Absolutely. Is it wrong? To, oh, it depends on the situation. I mean, if they're attacking you or they're trying to kill you or for, for certain crimes, but generally it's wrong. Is it wrong to kill a deer and eat it? No, they taste great. Go for it. Okay, thank you for the response, Kent. And quick final word from you at all, T-Jump? I'm good. All right, well, there we go. I appreciate all the great questions and super chats that have come in. Time flies by. This was definitely a debate to remember. It was a much anticipated debate and it was worth the wait. So logical, plausible, probable sends in a super chat. He says late night after show. I guess he could not resist. He was supposed to take the night off, but this debate was too much fun. So he is having an after show. He says, look for link in the chat. Tom, Dr. Hoven, thank you so much for giving us your time for tonight. Let's have some final words, final thoughts uh, before we shut it down. Uh, T-Jump, again, thank you so much. Final words. Uh, thanks, Donnie, for hosting. Appreciate it always. Thank you, Kent, for showing up. Appreciate uh, the conversation. It was really entertaining and talking to both of you guys, as always. Uh, thanks for hosting the show. I appreciate always the engaging conversations and debates between creationists and evolutionists. It's a, a good thing to have dialogue, even if we disagree. And so I appreciate it, as always. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Tom. And Kent, uh, thank you as well for doing this and engaging in so many debates lately as we have this evolution debate challenge. Uh, final thoughts, final words? Well, thank you. I enjoy doing it. Bring them on. I'll take them all on same time. Okay. I believe in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I believe that's the only logical answer we can come up with. Somebody had to design it. If I'm walking through the woods and find an arrowhead, I have, I have to conclude somebody made it. I might not know who, but I think somebody made it. That doesn't happen naturally. I think the evidence is overwhelming. There's a God. Some people don't want to see it. They so badly don't want to see it. They will instead believe wild ideas like they're related to an apple. Okay. I don't think that'll go well for you, Judgment Day. We'll see. Tom, come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. I'll give you the tour. Yeah, we should do a live debate at your place sometime. That'd be awesome. In-person debate. I didn't understand a word of that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> on stage? We should do it on stage. Oh, okay, debate. sure. Yep, come on. You're, you're invited. The next debate can be live and in person and even more fun than uh, tonight. So again, Kent, T-Jump, thanks for a wild debate, a fun debate. We'll let you guys get out of here. Uh, blessings to the chat. Thank you for tuning in. And Sandy for Truth is out.